Yeah, well, many thanks for the introduction. And first of all, I have to thank my co-author, Henrik Dembinski, who provided a big number of data, which I'm happy to use here. Uh, yeah, let's uh, see into this. I think I do not need to motivate what we do here, and I do certainly not need to motivate higher fuel injection pressures. But I want to use this chart here with, with tailpipe suit measurements to consider why is higher fuel pressure really ending up in less suit because fuel pressure acts across the length of the needle and suit is what we find out here in an optical engine where the suit clouds are appearing and in the end it is these suit particles which have to mix with the air which we find here and uh, what's the role of fuel injection pressure which is actually acting along the length of the nozzle hole, one millimeter or so. So this was my starting point and the question <coughs> above that is how can higher injection pressure end up with lower engine out suit? Can we understand the mechanisms? I hope so. If we understand the mechanisms, then of course there is the question of how to exploit them. And I'm not going to address this, I'm rather going to address the question of which kind of analysis would we require to understand this and to open our eyes into improvements and exploitations. Which brings me to the content of uh, my presentations, these uh, seven points. I start with, our, I already have started with the injection pressure question. And let's have a brief look into flow events inside the nozzle with model flow experiments we did some 10, 20 years ago. So it's a collection of 20 years of data, if you take it this way. Then it's the spray interaction with the insulin, the gas, the momentum transfer, the heat transfer, ignition, premixed and diffusion flames. And uh, when we see diffusion flames, we again have to get rid of the suit, which brings me to the main point of what I'm talking about and then how do we succeed to bring and put the things together before I summarize what I'm going to talk about. This left hand slide here gives you an idea of how we succeed to look into flow phenomena and here I have to be careful into flow phenomena where uh, we think we can capture a certain number of flow phenomena inside such a nozzle. Of course, I have no means to look into these nozzles, but we can make a slice of these nozzles into this two-dimensional plate, sandwich this between windows, and pressurize the side up here. We fill it with diesel, so we have high-pressure diesel here. It flows yeah, between the body and the needle of, of this model, 2D model nozzle, uh, into the uh, nozzle hole and out again not into combustion chamber but in this case into into liquid and what we see here is yeah transparent diesel transparent diesel here and not so transparent gas bubbles inside uh, this uh, geometry here with some uh, variations which make us aware of the fact of course I do not have the 1000 or 3000 bar injection pressure we have to go to this four, five, six hundred bar injection pressure. The back pressure down here is in this case one bar and the needle lift, well that's the space you see here. We have the 400 bar here, forcing <laughs> the diesel down here and you see a big number or a large area of, of non-transparent fluid. Of course this is cavitation and the cavitation is induced by the uh, shear layer between the fast and the not so fast uh, liquid in this geometry. Then the flow bends into the sac volume, bends over into the nozzle hole. Here again we see a lot of cavitation bubbles before it enters this low pressure side. Of course this is of no importance in the diesel engine but it gives us an idea that here we have again <coughs> cavitation bubbles as we have the uh, shear layers between the fast and the not so fast liquid here. Yeah, This is at one bar if we pressurize this up to 30 bar, then the pressure forces these cavitation bubbles back into the nozzle hole. Again, you see the formation 
of the Xi layer cavitation as it comes down here. Cavitation as the flow enters the nozzle hole and then discharges into this 30 bar low pressure side. With large and middle lift, the flow does not so much fill the sac, but it bends over here and we see the flow separation and the cavitation here in this part of the, uh, of the uh, nozzle hole. I think the most important thing to consider here, and every one of you being in the fuel injection pressures uh, business is aware of this, is that along a nozzle hole of, let's say, one millimeter, or however long this is, uh, the main part of the pressure is discharged within the first fractions of a millimeter as the diesel enters into these nozzle holes. We can make pressure measurements by very special op optical techniques. And uh, what we have done here is, you see this 300 bar, that's low pressure side, that's how the pressure discharges into, the, into this part of the nozzle hole and then recaptures again as we exit here. So down here we have these very low pressures which give rise to cavitation. And when we talk about these pressures, it's below one bar, even if we may have 300 or 1,000 bar on the upstream side. And if we now change the geometry here, smoothen the geometry, we allow the pressure to come deeper into the nozzle hole. You know this and you, you use this in the tapered nozzle holes of diesel injection equipment. I still wanted to show this because I doubt that uh, you have direct access to such measurements. Of course you do simulations, but having the measurements is, is another thing. Here I go here. A step further, we have, here we look into the nozzle, the length of this model nozzle. The red part here is liquid diesel. If we go down here, diesel starts to cavitate and makes these bubbles. Here in this, in these statistical representations, it's no more black and white, but it is red and, and blue and each color in between. This tells me that here we have transparent diesel. The diesel starts to cavitate along this nozzle hole and here it does exit into ambient air at low pressure. And the length, you see, 800 microns, 800 microns, so very close to the exit orifice of this nozzle hole. Uh, the blue here is the non-transparent spray. This would be the spray core. The red here is air. Very low pressure and we more or less have a laminar jet coming out here with large fluctuations very close to the nozzle here. Of course, the pressure is just an academic game. If you now increase the pressure, we get more and more into, into the turbulent uh, part of, of the spray with, you see the spray cone is opening to the cone angles you are used to have, but this is still turbulent and it is not fully cavitating uh, as we uh, find it now here. So if we now change from 120 to 800 bar, then we have very well established cavitation inside the nozzle hole. And the consequence of the spray is that the small fluctuations here on the periphery of this spray are, are almost gone. So my understanding of increased pressure very close to the nozzle is that uh, uh, high injection pressure creates very intensive cavitation and the intensive cavitation is stabilizing the spray as it exits the nozzle hole. Now let's have a look further downstream as we move now into the combustion chamber of, of research engines or of, of real engines. Of course you can make uh, penetration measurements. Uh, here we do measurements of the diameter of this spray core and spray core is what we see here in black rather than these uh, vapor clouds. And if we do this spray diameter measurements with very high time resolutions, then we see the traces of cavitation appearing inside the nozzle. And that's these spikes which we see here. And here we have 1500 bar fuel injection pressure at a distance uh, against the nozzle hole of these 15 millimeters. Here you see how what influence we find out from injection pressure. 500 bar, we see these this ligaments and these fluctuations of the spray diameter from start of injection until the end of injection at a distance of 15 millimeters downstream from the nozzle. 
here is time or degree crank angle. If we increase it to 800 bar, yeah, not very different. If we go to 1500 bar, I now see that all of these directional fluctuations, the, the spray going slightly to one side and the other are gone. And the spray targeting is highly stable. Of course, we also see that these high frequency ligaments now come at higher frequencies. Sure, because we have higher velocities, but the source of these disruptions certainly is the cavitation inside the nozzle hole. Now, we are inside the combustion chamber here, still in a combustion chamber of a research engine. Uh, <coughs> Uh, somewhere here it says that we have pressure of 50, 55 bar and a temperature of 900 Kelvin. So there's intensive heat transfer going on from the pressurized air into the spray. And when we make Schlieren images of this, we now very nicely see that this spray core uh, ends up in fuel vapor. So very rare occasion to see uh, fuel vaporizing by some uh, special optical techniques inside this uh, research engine combustion chamber. And uh, yeah, you see the timing here. You see this two, three, four hundred microseconds interval between subsequent images. And I think the most important thing to uh, see here is that when we talk about spray cone angles, in this case here, we usually refer to the liquid part of it. And whenever you look into the literature, this is about 20 degrees. Whereas once the droplets start to vaporize, it's more or less an explosion of vapor into the lateral direction. <coughs> this is where we now will find the start of combustion. Not in this case, because it's hidden here in the dark areas, but uh, okay, still some statistics uh, saying when we go into higher fuel injection pressures. We do not so much see a lengthening of the spray core, but we see that the vapor phase penetrates deeper and of course faster into the combustion chamber and we have higher rates of evaporation, not surprisingly. So, uh, this is now a view into the combustion chamber of an optical engine, which was operated at about 60 bar. So, uh, we had to use pilot injection to reduce ignition delay time. By the way, that's the piston. And we really now look into the, or we illuminate the internal part of this uh, piston so that we can see the spray with time intervals, which I put in here. And from zero to 50 microseconds, we see this presence of the blue flame. 50 microseconds later, the blue flame areas, of course, the premixed part of combustion get larger. And 50 microseconds later, uh, the premixed flame is now igniting the diffusion flame. And from now on, it gets so bright that we have no chance to see anything of these blue flames anymore. So this is how heat transfer ends up in fuel vapor. When we look into these engines, of course, we have no chance to see the vapor, but we see the consequence of it. The ignition, the self-ignition being apparent here in these bluish colored flames, the premixed flames, and then igniting the rich fuel <coughs> coming uh, out uh, on the sprays. Now I go into a, into, into a slightly larger engine, two liter heavy duty engine, an optical engine with a uh, window inserted on the piston here you see the sketch of it, here you see a photograph. This is a different piston than was used here, but it gives you quite nicely a view in, into that. And uh, these engines are operated at 150, 160 bar peak firing pressure, MEP 10 bar, 20 bar, you see this. Uh, here still uh, we see some traces of premixed flames, but you see very short time after that, as we see into this diffusion flames, they are just bright and overwhelming, everything uh, we would uh, see here in these movies. Uh, so if we want to see the diffusion flame, we have, we have to reduce the sensitivity of the camera. And uh, yeah, this is what we are going to find out in such an optically heavy duty uh, diesel engine. I think that here 
Ethereum wieder 1500, 2500 bar shooting out the sprays. In this case, we, we are not illuminating the combustion chamber. The illumination is provided by the flames here. So you may see the illuminated sprays. And of course, we see the flames. And the flames, we are saying here, this is hot suit. Now, uh, during injection, as I pass it through, we are we um, coming closer to the end of injection. Yeah. See the collapsing of the sprays as they come out of the nozzle. And that's uh, quite nicely seen in these movies. The clouds, oh, this is too fast. The clouds, the, the suit clouds, you know, let's see for the last time. They are, of course, starting here, but after the end of injection, they start to move back into the center. Brief view into the pressures. Such an engine, we have collected this because of the peak firing pressure, 150, 70 bar. You see, part of the green injection at 10 bar IMP. Of course, the uh, engine was highly boosted. This one I've selected not because of the peak pressure, but it's not down at 145 bar, but IMP is 20 bar. Down here, you see the IMP sequence, so that's zero, but that's motoring. It's firing for a few cycles, it's back to motor. We catch out the, the first few cycles here. Now, uh, what has this to do with, with suit formation and suit oxidation? Here, the tailpipe suit measurements, of course, not in the optical engine, this doesn't make any sense, but this is reminding us of the fuel pressure effect on suit. When we now use the movies we just have seen, and apply two color methods, then we can nicely follow the suit formation and suit oxidation. Suit is formed during injection, it peaks at about the end of injection, and then it takes time to oxidize the suit particles until we lose trace of them simply because the suit may be too cold to be visible in these movies. But what we very nicely see is when we go from 500 to 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 bar fuel injection pressure, uh, suit formation is faster at higher injection pressures because we put in more fuel per degree crank angle, but suit oxidation is much faster as we go into this 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 bar. And if we say, okay, everything which is not consumed or oxidized at, at the few degrees crank angle here will cool down and go out through the tailpipe, then it is very clear that this is better choice than this one, and 500 bar, of course, is nothing we are interested in. So how can it be that injection pressure improves air utilization? Henrik Dembinski has done his PhD with his data, and what we have seen visually with these clouds moving along, he has put into PIV software, and uh, the outcome is that we see that when we shoot the sprays out here, it's, of course, very high velocities of the sprays, but the flames, the flame clouds we see, they are coming back. You see the velocity distributions here. They are moving back the flame clouds into the center. This is close to end of injection. This is 10 degrees after the end of injection. And now you see fairly high velocities out in, in the periphery of this combustion chamber bowl and surprisingly high velocities around the center here. Now, this is at 2,000 bar fuel injection pressure, and uh, just to understand the consequence of pressures, 200 bar, nobody will do uh, this operation, but uh, to see the contrast. That's the flame distribution at 200 bar, this is at 2,000 bar. The 200 bar reflection of this momentum we put into this brace is, is, is almost non-existent. Whereas at 2,000 bar with the much higher velocities and momentum, we get considerable reflection of this momentum on the piston bowl wall so that the suit clouds now can move back into the central part where you have seen this in the movie. Uh, at this time, there is still unused air here 
at the end of injection, here is 10 degrees after the end of injection. We already have seen this, no action at all with this very low pressure. Yeah, and my conclusion when we look into the movies, when we digest the, the velocities of field series, that injection pressure drives the flame back into areas of unused air. So much about air utilization, but that's just one part of it. The second part is turbulence. So we not only have to move the clouds where there is air, we also have to move the clouds very fast so that we can take advantage of the high temperature and we have to mix them very fast with the oxygen and the air present there. And the measure of mixing is always the turbulent part of it. Here you see a comparison, fuel injection at 500 bar, fuel injection at 1000 bar. This we already have seen, the presence of the flame clouds, the velocity field driving the flame clouds, and now the turbulence field. That's about at the end of injection. That's a few degrees later, that's a few more degrees later. So high turbulence here in the center. If we go from 500 to 1000, much higher turbulence here. But turbulence is decaying. You can follow the decay of turbulence or of kinetic energy and you have to be more precise. This is a plot of the overall kinetic energy across this field versus degree crank angle. Whereas here we have gone for the local turbulent kinetic energy. If you have questions on the specifics, please contact uh, Dr. Dembinski. But it very nicely shows us that what we see here visually on these cross sections in terms of time evolution, this is about the end of injection. And very shortly after the end of injection, this kinetic energy decays with 1,000 bar fuel injection pressure, the very same effect, but we start at a much higher level. If you, if you now pull the things together, yeah, these examples are 500 bar fuel injection pressure, the peak kinetic energy and the decay of that yeah, ends up with a suit formation, suit oxidation as we see it here. When we go to 1,000, bar fuel injection pressure, the peak soot formation is higher, but the soot oxidation is faster, significantly faster than with the 500 bar example. And of course, the higher pressure we go, that's what we have seen in the tailpipe soot, the more effective this transport and mixing becomes. So it's the transport of the soot to meet with insulin the air, and it is the use of turbulence for fast suit air mixing. We've seen turbulence is present for, for, for long degree crank angle <laughs> periods, so we have to take advantage of a time window of, let's say, five, 10 degrees after the end of injection, which decides about successful and less successful air utilization. And I think you've seen these examples, so I need not repeat it. Now let's pull the things together Fuel injection pressure, of course, acts along this one millimeter nozzle hole. Essentially what we see when we do this, this optical analysis is the higher fuel injection pressure, the higher the stability of the spray is, and the cavitation introduced into the nozzle is the main source of turbulence as the spray then enters the combustion chamber. And the consequence of that are these ligaments and the droplets we see when we look into the sprays. And of course, the, the main thing of fuel injection pressures is, is uh, the momentum introduced into the spray, but we can take advantage of this uh, momentum in the sprays as we have it collide with the surface of the piston bowl and redirect the fuel uh, the, the soot clouds back into the center of the combustion chamber where there is oxygen to oxidize the soot. So this was the content of what I was showing. And the analysis you have seen here was mainly done in optical diesel engines with, that's the big emphasis here, with realistic temperature, realistic pressure, and realistic geometry parameters. 
I thank you very much.